Hello, and welcome to Dice Punks, a tabletop role-playing podcast where we focus on playing full campaigns in less well-known systems. This week in episode one, we're getting started on our first campaign using a combination of the Rain and Nobilis systems. Thank you for joining us. I'm Adam, your friendly neighborhood game master, with a few brief remarks before we get to the other introductions. Part of the idea behind starting this podcast was to do an actual play show in less well-known systems, and I got so excited about it that in this inaugural campaign, we're playing in a combined system I cooked up that bears some description. Most of the players you're about to hear from are playing a character who was, until recently, mortal, but who has since been given an estate, something in the cosmos that they're the master over and that they're responsible for. So each of these characters has a set of stats and skills describing who they were and what they could do as mortals, which is where we're using the rules for Greg Stoltz's fantasy system in his trademark one roll engine, Rain. On top of that, though, each character also has their newly granted divine, demigodly nature and abilities, for which we're using Jenna Katerin Moran's Diceless Nobilis system. This divine status and power does come from somewhere, though, a godlike entity called an Imperator who our players helped design, and who our fearless heroes will meet for the first time during this session. So, without further ado, let's meet our heroes and their players. Hi, I'm Drew, and I will be playing Dosk Tyr, the Duke of Nothing. I'm Robin, and I'll be playing Lissa, the towering, flirtatious Duchess of Fury. I'm Dez, and I will be playing Rumnet, who is not ennobled, but is instead having a church built up around him. Excellent descriptions all, thank you. In just a moment, we're going to hear from each of our characters about their commencement, the moment when they became partly divine and its aftermath, Uh, but first I thought I'd say a few words about our setting. Our heroes live in a world called Mieleth, but know little of the areas outside of their home region of Taraxis. Taraxis is large, populated, and culturally, linguistically, and economically cohesive enough to be a country, but it lacks anything so organized as a central government. Instead, it's dominated by a series of large trading cities along the coast to the west, and a smaller one along the main river, the Seru. The largest and most powerful of these cities is Calavan, just south and west of the Seru Delta. Hospitable lands in the plains, hills, and valleys tends to be thoroughly populated with towns, villages, farms, and ranches, while mountains, deserts, deep forests, and wetlands are usually avoided, and have long been where dangers big and small lurk. Taraxans call the tropical forest to the north the Shadowed Lands, and avoid venturing or even going ashore there, though some of their merchants do sail beyond it to trade. To the south, Taraxis trails off along the coast to the west among the cool plains and wetlands of the Hinterlands, and ends in the east at the edge of the vast, cold desert called the Carolan Waste. Jutting far far north into Taraxis between these two regions is the massive range of tall, rocky mountains called the Desolation. That's certainly enough for a broad sketch, and our heroes hail from many parts of Taraxis, so we'll get more acquainted with our setting through hearing their stories. So let's begin with your commencement, Dosk. Tell us how you became a demigod. So I'm in Theret, where I'm from, and I'm comparing notes with a a student from I don't know where, it doesn't really matter. And I I mention who I am, I don't like to talk about it, but I come from the... Yes, when I say my name is Dosk Tyr, I'm from the Tyr family, everyone's heard of us. I I really don't like to talk about it. Anyway, we're talking about philosophy, and, uh, and he says that he thinks you can't really understand the nature of reality until you've read this one specific book of which there's only one copy in the city of... Theret. And I'm, if I may be perfectly honest, a bit drunk at this point. So I say, what book? And he says, in order to find out, you'll need to arm wrestle me. And I say, that's ridiculous. But of course, I'm already taking off my glove. I wear gloves everywhere. My hands are musicianly and I like to protect them. Anyway, I remove my right glove and we arm wrestle and I win, of course. And uh, with with no effort whatsoever, really. And he tells me the name of the book, and I decide that I'm going to take a journey to Theret. So I hire a carriage at no small expense, I must say. But you should know this about me. When I'm curious about something, I can't let it go. 
This has always been true about me, actually. I, I, I'm sort of an omnivore for information. When I get a notion in my head, there's absolutely no possibility of my stopping until I've exhausted my curiosity. Absolutely. I, my family wanted me to be a merchant. It was never quite going to happen. I was going to be, always going to be a student of everything, it seems. So anyway, I make my way to Ferret, and I ask around, and I, I find my way to the library, and I charm my way in, really. I don't, you know, I'm not a local. What right have I to be there? But I have every right to be there, because it has information I need. I look around the first floor, the second floor, the foyer, nothing, nothing. This book is nowhere in attendance, nowhere in evidence. I do, however, find a door down. So I find a basement. Uh, I I, of course, purchase a lantern in town. I don't carry a lantern with me. That would be strange. But I find one. I bring it down into the basement. And I look, and I look, and the book is nowhere. But I do find another door down into a sub-basement. And I go down, and then I find another door. <laughs> no book, but another door down into a sub-sub-basement. And... At this point, my torch is going to run out, so I cap the lantern and I go back up. I, I hire a, a hotel room for the night, and I decide that I'll come back the next day. I do no small amount of carousing, but uh, better left undescribed, I suppose. I go back the next day, three layers down, no book, four layers down, no book, five layers down, no book, another night of carousing. It's best not to describe, a gentleman doesn't tell. I go back to the hotel and then back to the library, seven, eight layers down. At some point, I lose count. I'm going to find this book. Whatever it takes, I'm going to find this book. And eventually, I go so deep that there's simply no way my lantern will last. And I find myself waiting simply looking at the flame quavering and about to go out and realize that I'm about to find myself in absolute darkness. All right. Just a quick correction there, Dosk. There it is indeed where you're from, but you also said it was where you traveled to in search of this elusive tome. In fact, uh, the city the book was said to reside in was Selvin, uh, the only inland major trading city located along the Sarah River. With that clarified, though, let's move on. And, uh, Lissa, how did you come to be ennobled? Would it be too trite to say that it began on a day like any other? <laughs> I was at home in Pelton in the process of smelting ore from the mines when I heard voices from the front of the smithy. At first they were cordial, but then they shifted. I wiped the sweat and soot from my brow, grabbed Electo, my hammer, and went to investigate. The landlord had sent five thugs to collect our rent. By the time I made it to the front of the smithy, the men had already pushed Varric to the ground. I could see a fresh welt on his brow, and, well, of course I got a little angry. Varric had taken me under his wing, taught me everything he knew about blacksmithing, and gave me work and a roof over my head. He was family. I helped him to his feet and stepped between him and the men. I did try to defuse the situation. I scolded them for bullying an old man and suggested that we could arrive at some agreement, maybe grab drinks later. They did not relent. Problem was that we had paid rent, the amount we'd agreed upon, but the landlord wanted more and more each month. I stood my ground. The men pulled out chains and batons. They said that once they were done with me, they would break Varric's hands. Something tore through me. White, hot, and blinding. Not, not light, but darkness. The pain came in shocks. Each blow was a hammer fall, reshaping me into a new form. I'd never felt such heat before. Such fury. Distantly, I heard a hiss like the quenching of new-formed steel, and though the transformation was complete, I still did not wholly understand this new presence that had been annealed into my soul. My physical form felt meaningless. I could feel them, the repressed heat and hatred of an incomprehensible horde of minds. They were embers in the dark, and I reached out to them. 
Shackles fell, I rose, and I gave myself to the burgeoning shadows. I was not wholly in my right mind when the darkness finally ebbed. My throat felt raw, my vision was blurred, and even if I could see clearly, I doubt that I could have comprehended the sights around me with any added clarity. My mortal form felt weak, but that new presence within me felt satiated. Home was home no longer. For a time, I could do nothing but weep. Varric eventually came out from hiding. I could feel him hovering behind me as though unsure whether to comfort me or banish me. Eventually, he suggested that we head to Laurentin. Lay low for a while, keep our heads down. But I felt a pull from within, like an impatient master tugging on the leash of a petulant dog. The obsidian god, who I now knew to be called Mott, was calling us to the desolation, the mounted range that lay beyond our home. We began the climb, and it was all rocks and sand, and well, Varric is old, so our progress was painfully slow. We followed the Wayland River up, up, up until chill gnawed at our bones and the river vanished somewhere into the mountain. Eventually, we found a cave entrance. It was like a great and terrible maw opening in the side of the desolation, with a stream-like spittle trickling from its rocky cavern. I was concerned about this path at first. It seemed like we had to squeeze through narrow space after narrow space, and at times we had to crawl on our hands and feet. My hands became raw, my, fleet, my feet were blistered, and everything was just perpetually damp. After an interminable amount of time, the cave opened into an underground forest. It was quite beautiful. Stalagmites and stalactites stretched in all directions, as far as the eyes could see, and bioluminescent creatures provided an eerie blue light to the scene. At the heart of this underground forest was a hole of perfect darkness, with the sound of the Waylon roaring far below. I felt that tug again, and knew that I had to jump. All right, we'll be sure to see what happened to Lissa after that. But first, we need to hear from Romnet. What's Romnet been up to? So, the bar is louder than the city an observer would walk in from. Good cheer and carousing and games of chance in the back. At a table, in the center, sits a hulk of a man with dark hair and a full beard in a nicish linen shirt that serves to emphasize the physique it strains to contain. On his lap, Grinning and whispering something into the bigger man's ear is a beautiful man with reddish-brown hair in crisp, dark clothing and wearing several pieces of jewelry, black stones set in black metal. A nervous-looking woman approaches us, hesitantly, like she knows the degree to which she's intruding on my good time. Uh, excuse me, uh, sir? Mm, duty calls, my friend, I say, as I pat the man whose lap I'm sitting in, on his cheek and shift so that I'm facing the table rather than man. From a pocket, I pull out a deck of cards, a bowl, and a stoppered bottle. A pitcher of water appears on the table, this is a known process, and I pour two drops of liquid from bottle to pitcher. Fluid dynamics shouldn't spread the inky blackness through the pitcher so quickly, but within its moments it is dark as the night outside. I pour the liquid into the bowl, as well as, mo er, as well as into a glass for the querent. The querent slides a small bag of coins to the prophet as she drinks down the glass, blackening her mouth and tongue and lips. I disappear the coins into a pocket. Knowledge has prices. Ask. Does the reflection I see in the canals love me back? I tap the water in the bowl just enough to send ripples to the edge. 
I place my wet finger on my black tongue, tasting darkness and possibility. I draw three cards from the deck and look at them without showing the querent. There is more in the cards than the answer to the question, and that knowledge was not paid for. Yes, she does. But your plan to rush through the reflection and find him is self-undermining. Let her instead come to you. Hospitality is required. Generosity is permissive. As ever, knowledge of the obsidian god is forbidden. The woman nods her thanks and leaves the bar. Another petitioner steps forward now that they see that the prophet of the obsidian god is at least partly present for business matters. They hesitate, though, because as they put coin to table, I double over. The man on whose thigh I have been sitting puts an arm around it, my chest to keep me from hitting my head on the table. A voice in my head tells me that his children and tools are and harbingers come. I become aware through the onslaught of the darkened thought that my presence is required. I apologize. I must go to the heart. Find me tomorrow or the night after, as your schedule permits, and I will prophesy for you then. I extricate myself from my companion and give him a farewell kiss on the forehead. He, I leave the tavern and proceed with all due haste to the manifestation, an immense edifice to the obsidian god that is at once fortress and cathedral and primordial, well, edifice. Within, I find a side door to which I alone have the key. I unlock it and descend an unknown number of steps to find myself in a lightless cave with a divine well. Also in a lightless cave with a divine well, in short order, are Dosk Tyr. Uh, would you describe yourself to the onlookers in this dark cave as you emerge from what you thought was the seventh or eighth sub-basement of a library into what appears to be a cavern wrought entirely of obsidian? Anyone looking who could see would see a man who is making himself as conspicuous as possible and yet is also somehow hiding. An unremarkable build, and they would know right away a less than commanding voice since he'd be muttering mot, mot, without quite knowing why. The first thing they'd probably notice would be his patchwork of mismatched clothes, uh, a doublet, uh, leather jerkin, gloves of bright colors, each a fine piece, but none of them with any reference to another. A man whose appearance makes no particular statement, but makes it very loudly. They would also notice that he was conspicuously hair suit, beard and hair banded, and always threatening to explode into an unruly storm cloud. But for now, under control. Also emerging into this obsidian underworld uh, is Lissa from, well, where you thought you were going to splash into a river. You instead emerge into an obsidian cave. What would an onlooker see as you do? Uh, the first thing they'd probably see is me hit my head. <laughs> I'm a mountain of a woman towering in at six foot seven, and I have innumerable piercings, baubles, bracelets, and buckles, but all of those things don't quite distract from the onyx coils of a two-headed snake tattoo that spans my entire body. You may think it's a trick of the light, but those bands seem to shift every once in a while. Of course, I have my hammer with me, uh, and I'm also still wearing my black apron um, that I use at the smithy, but I might be looking a little worse for wear, considering my journey. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, probably the thing that Ramda is paying the most attention to is the roughly hewn obsidian well in the center of the room, but Dask, as you become aware of your surroundings and aware that they are not the 7th or 8th sub-basement of the library you were in, um, your gaze is drawn to an alcove on one side that it kind of seems like you shouldn't be able to see. There isn't really any light in here, and yet you can just make it out. It seems completely abstract at first, but you feel a sort of kinship or a pull, and as you observe it, it resolves in your mind not just shapes, but 
the shapes of a workshop or a laboratory or maybe even a library, all three perhaps and more, uh, seating and surfaces, shelves and tools, but all of it just sculpted out of the rock over out of one wall. Uh, it seems inchoate in some way, as though the carving was unfinished, but the longer you look at it, the more you understand what each element of it is. In fact, you're pretty sure that it's not just your vision adjusting, it's actually the detail with which this has been hewn out of the rock seems to be sharpening as you behold it. You feel a strong affinity for this alcove. Similarly, Lissa, as you emerge uh, into this space from you're not entirely sure where, your eyes are drawn to a particular pillar of obsidian nearby where the well stands. Around this pillar is wrapped climbing a not entirely familiar and yet somehow very familiar serpent in a pose that suggests that it is not currently threatened or threatening but wouldn't take very much provoking uh, as you watch you perceive more and more detail the eyes are watchful glistening you even think you see the head move a little bit to cast its gaze around the cavern but of course that can't be right and you don't detect any actual movement just differences in position between moments odd but nevertheless you feel an affinity for the carving of the snake all of this however uh is overridden pretty quickly I, uh, Romnet, you probably expect what comes next a little bit more, hence your attention to the well, and despite noting the two strangers who have emerged, but out of the well, seemingly from a great distance, echoes a voice. It's a strange voice, certainly not a human voice. It sounds... well, sounds is the wrong word. You don't really hear it with your ears, but you nevertheless perceive it as a sound. If pressed, the best way you could describe it is a heartbreakingly beautiful scream. Well, several, perhaps, layered over one another. The voice emerges from the well and says, Welcome, my children, to the heart of Fermata. You have been summoned here because you have been entrusted with fury and nothing to be my stewards of these ideas here in this strangely static world. I have returned, you see, from a long indifference, and I require agents. Return here. When next it is darkest out. In the meantime, my prophet shall be able to fill you in on your responsibilities. The voice echoes quite dramatically around the chamber for what seems like longer than it should. Romnet, for what it's worth, you have no idea what this voice is talking about. <laughs> yeah. As the echoes fade... I'm shocked. Dask and Lissa, you... See Romnet, you see the cavern, you see each other. You are currently standing in an unfamiliar obsidian cave, having received cryptic instructions with a uh, somewhat flustered but also somewhat frustrated looking stranger. Well, aren't you two a sight for sore eyes? Welcome. I gather my clamus about me. Uh, did I mention I also wear a clamus on top of all the rest? I think it makes me look philosophic. Anyway, I gather it up and I puff myself and I say, what is happening? Though it probably sounds better than that. Put, put out of character point of reference. Yes. A, a camus? I thought, you, I thought there was an L in there. Clamus? Is it just camus? No, no, no. I'm inquiring what nature, what, what manner of garment. That yeah, is. that's what it is. Yeah, like the Greek, the Greek, like, you were... No, this needs to go in an outtake. This is some, this is some who's on first shit. No, it's the, 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 the Greek robe thing that you hold with one arm that, like, Socrates is the Oh, okay, wearing. sure, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Like, not actually Greek, but, like, Renaissance thought it looked Greek kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
leave it in, take it out. You're 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 the GM. I I do like that Dusk has already caused sartorial inquiry. <laughs> that's that's the brand. <laughs> One sentence of dialogue. Uh you're in Fermata. I say it as if this is completely self explanatory. Uh, I know my sense of direction is not always ideal, but I was just in the desolation, so how did I get from there to here? Do I know, Adam? Or can (laughs) I surmise? Not really, but it seems pretty clear that the Obsidian God brought them here somehow. Divine intervention, probably darkness. Hmm. Darkness checks out. These lands are very shadowed. Are these the shadowed lands? No. That's a forest to the north. Is it? I mean, I knew that, of course. Yeah, it is. This isn't that. Uh, for reference, since I didn't actually mention in my intro, like, uh, Rumnut is a little over six foot, and uh, I think I wrote him as ornamentally attractive, but not with a build useful for doing work <laughs> i seem to remember those details being in your character sheet yes uh so he makes a good profit <laughs> yes uh, people so... follow me and then i tell them what to do when things actually need doing <laughs> uh so so i'm shorter than you are for those to, for those listeners to whom this is an important thing i'm i'm about five i'm about five nine um so if, if you're if you're picturing eye lines dear listener <laughs> that's that's probably an important note uh how tall is lissa lissa's, lissa's quite tall lissa. six seven six how seven tall are you, lissa? <laughs> yeah yeah everybody's looking up at lissa yeah, there yeah. <laughs> in fact um where you came into the cavern at least where you came to rest lissa is tall enough for you to stand up but you're gonna have to duck to get pretty much anywhere else in here mm-hmm. yeah i'm probably gonna hit my head a bit more too but I-, I do have two questions uh first is where do we go if we think a mistake has been made because i'm the least angry person that you'll ever meet and the second is where do we go to get a drink in here and you want to get one with me i like both of her questions that. a lot and i would like answers immediately please <laughs> thank you i don't know that anger has anything to do with it If the Obsidian God chose you, it was clearly for a reason, although they are not uh, generally very forthcoming with reasons, more with instructions and headaches. Uh, (laughs) As to a drink, there are several lovely places. Would you prefer a quiet city or the riotous city? Riotous, I say immediately. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I just go along with it. <laughs> As the show. word quiet dies on my lips. <laughs> Assuming I don't actually need to roll anything to notice that. Well, no, you notice it. I can point out some spots that you might prefer after, if that would be acceptable. What are your names? Uh, Dask Tier. And, uh, I mean, quiet's fine, too. But no, riotous, riotous, definitely riotous. <laughs> oh, that's a crate. I, I just want a, a drink and a warm meal at this point, so I am not picky. Okay. I'm Romna. Right. A pleasure, I think. Uh, nice to meet <laughs> you both, Dosk Romna. A pleasure, uh, Lissa. Uh, I say looking <laughs> with my neck craned completely up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't notice. <laughs> it's normal. That's just how people's necks are, you know? It's just how people are shaped down there. <laughs> yeah. I I remember there being a story one time when the Thrilling Adventure Hour had Weird Al Yankovic on about how to, that was the only time they were ever like starstruck by one of their guests. <laughs> and in remembering it, one of them went I wonder if that's just how Weird Al sees the world, is just full of people who are quiet, shy, and happy to see you. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, probably. That would be kind of lovely. Yeah. 
So would I be correct then in assuming, Romnet, that you lead the oh, newcomers yes. up out of the heart? Up, it up is out a of the lot heart. of stairs. A lot of stairs. But it's very hard to count them. That is true. Doesn't stop me from uh, counting them. I should have rolled to see how many times I hit my head on the way up. <laughs> I probably, uh, after the third bonk, just, like, start pointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, even with the pointing, roll 3d10 to see how many times you bonk your head. <laughs> first roll. <laughs> yeah, our first roll for a pair of head bonks. Oh, Lord. Uh, I got a pair of ones. Okay, so only two, and then you... It's, it's, it's obsidian, right? So it's, like hard and angular it hurts so you start kind of paying attention to when Romnet is you know kind of pointing at, at places where the ceiling descends um actually while we're at the rolling uh just to, to ease us into it Dosk if you want to uh roll sense sight uh, I think you could probably do sense scrutinize okay. actually which would be four dice for you uh, we can do we can do some rolls, some actual rain one roll in. What is this? Some kind of RPG or something? That's the rumor. I'm told. I have got holy shit! I've got four sixes. Wow! You rolled four dice and got four That's sixes. What happened? What a waste! If you want, if you want evidence, I can move my camera. But I, I, I trust you. I believe you. Um, that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Nine. That is actually three um, sixes. One is a nine. I blame uh, the socket, well, but that is actually three really good. Uh, you count you get to uh, you get to 75 steps and then something strange happens because you continue counting and you're pretty sure you didn't make a mistake but you never move past 75 Hmm. it's bizarre and you can't quite account for it but you're walking for probably another three minutes up these stairs uh, you know at a pretty rapid clip uh, but every new number you count in your memory is 75. It's very strange. Hmm. Okay, this, is an, this is an aside, and like I said, cut it if you want, but as a person with actual OCD, I find I didn't know this was a horror game. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give away too much <laughs> of this early, but I find that most games that I run have horror games? some patina of being a horror every word you met adam <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, you you Hello, listener may not have gentlemen. met adam we have so we're, we're expecting this it's a it's a it's a it's a stacker right the author who says that every every work of philosophy is a horror story and vice versa i'm just waiting for the flesh fountains to start <laughs> uh, maybe a few episodes okay. um <laughs> don't give it all away on the first date come on <laughs> You know, I struggle. I struggle with that. Someone um, needs to tell us of that. <laughs> <laughs> In a rather more literal sense, I suppose. Uh, you um, you eventually emerge uh, from a side door in a structure, a very grand cathedral-like structure, uh, that uh, nevertheless has very little of the sort of uh, ethereal refinement of your later cathedrals. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, very stolid, very forceful architecture. All of Obsidian. Brutalist uh, gothic. <laughs> I was trying to avoid the word brutalist because people have very strong opinions about it, but you're not wrong either. I know uh, people have very strong opinions about it. <laughs> there, there was a purpose. Fair enough. Um, Romnet, uh, you presumably lead them out. Uh, this this, this the... is, yeah, the, the edifice, the, the manifestation in the riotous city rather than the the quiet city so do we do we climb these stairs in silence or yeah i mean like has romnet made it clear that no questions are welcome or, or are we asking him what the hell's going on as we climb this infinite mario 64 staircase that we seem to be climbing i mean i i'm not in any way like making it clear that questions are not welcome because like it's my job and the god that has chosen me, like, for reasons deeply unclear to me, uh, seems to expect that I will, like, tell you shit. The problem is that I haven't any idea 
what manner of stuff it is that I am to be telling you. So feel free to ask questions and uh, I'll make up answers. Uh, so where are you from? What was your childhood like? <laughs> What's your favorite food? Um, I'm from here. Although it was not always here. Uh, Elucidate. I have 30 questions about that statement. <laughs> my, my childhood was... I don't know what even is a childhood. Uh, it's the part before you know what you're doing. So I think we're all still in it. Oh, so I I'm am. still a child. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely a giant child. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the song. I just want to hang out with Lissa. <laughs> this is the <Lissa>. song. <laughs> so you're, you're from here. I didn't know anyone was, was from here. Since we sort of ended up here, I, I guess I assumed no one was... I mean, it's an entire city. Sure. Like, it's... It's an entire city, by which I mean it's two cities that are opposite each other and interact, and... I have 30 additional Space questions about that statement. Space is weird. <laughs> I, say that, I say this like it's just fundamental and obvious and, like, shouldn't bear explanation. At the same time as I am struggling mightily to put it into words. <laughs> was the city that is also two cities ever not Fermata? And that's where you're really from, but now it's Fermata, so you don't know where you're from? I point at Lissa as though that's an extremely good point, and I wish some credit for it as well. <laughs> <laughs> this has not always been Fermata, but Fermata has always been here. I realize that's probably unhelpful. A lot of this is. I have a total of 67 questions uh, so far. Uh, we can take them whenever is convenient for you, I suppose. Uh, just uh, 67. We need to get this man a notepad and a pen. The, the, the <laughs> chief issue is that to everyone else, it has always been for Mata. But not to you. How old are you? Is that, is that rude? I'm very sorry if that's rude. I think I'm about 36. I lean, I lean forward as though he's going to say 36,000 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very well preserved. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I, my eyebrows raise just a bit. <laughs> to be fair, you're a very graceful 36. Uh, and an even more graceful 36,000, if indeed that's the case. Indeed. Uh, at about this time, you will emerge into the aforementioned, uh, what did we call it, brutalist gothic cathedral made of obsidian. Mm -hmm. um, and it's perfectly silent uh, in in this you know, cavernous chamber. Not for me, because my head uh, is saying 75, 75, 75. <laughs> again and again. But fair enough. Your ears are picking up nothing but your footsteps like, and whatever words every you're speaking. Spot in, every point in the manifestation is somehow a, an anti-node as far as acoustics go. Pretty much, yeah. Sound doesn't seem to carry in here. I shout not, out hello. There's no echo. <laughs> this is unsettling. I definitely need a drink. <laughs> Um, and so you head towards the front doors, which are massive, but swing open easily enough. One of them does anyway, uh, under Romnet's touch. And you emerge into sudden noise. Uh, people are thronging uh, the pathways on either side of a canal that uh, seems to submerge, like go under the earth, uh, under where this manifestation, this, this cathedral-like building is. Uh, if the word Cyclopean architecture means anything to you, uh, it is that, but extremely large and uh, seemingly all of one piece of obsidian, um, you know, as you emerge from it. But the city that spreads out before you is extremely odd, uh, physically impossible, you might say. Uh, there are buildings uh, fairly familiar to anyone who's been to one of the great trading cities of Taraxis. Um The architecture isn't strange, but everything is made of this black stone uh including the canals uh one of which is in front of you you can see where it splits left and right uh some ways down along either side of the canals are pedestrian walkways and roads for wagons and carts uh as well as on the other sides of those the you know actual rows of buildings which seem to include mostly in this area businesses and civic buildings 
Uh, but people are thronging the walkways. There are gondolas in the uh, canals. Uh, and people are moving about and talking, shouting and singing, playing musical instruments. A few people are even capering, uh, you know, as uh, though dancing to the music. Uh, seemingly in a ceaseless, dynamic mass. Um, what's really interesting, of course, is that it is night. Well, it's dark. There don't appear to be stars, just inky blackness beyond any place you can see a building or the ground. Uh, you know, well, inky implies that it has some sort of texture or viscosity or reflectivity, and it doesn't really have that. The darkness that surrounds you is absolute. There's no sun in the sky, no moon, no stars. And yet, you can see. Everything seems to have just this very faint, very subdued, vaguely silver kind of limb around it, where it's not exactly glowing or backlit, but somewhat picked out from the background of darkness. You can perceive color, muted though it may be. You can tell that this person has light hair, this person has dark, this person is wearing blue, that person is wearing red, but there's not exactly light anywhere either. Everything just seems to have its own almost subliminal corona of silvery muted light that helps you pick it out. Which makes it all the more surprising that as you near the canal, Romnet leading you down one side of it, you can see reflections in the canal. Um, you know, the uh, water is seemingly completely still uh, and only broken by the paddles and passage of the gondoliers. Uh, but the reflections in the canal match movement, location, lighting perfectly, but you don't see yourself in the reflection. You see another person uh, who seems to be leaning over the other side uh, of the reflection at the same time as you, with the same expression, the same movement and timing and positioning. Uh, the same goes for the buildings. You see buildings reflected, but not precisely the same buildings. Similar, but not the same. Uh, all of it is, frankly, a lot, uh, especially as you enter the crowds. I oscillate. I am shamelessly agog. And then I am deeply ashamed, but no less agog. And then I return to my previous state, and so on and so on. I am useless for several seconds. <laughs> I strut over to my reflection, and when I realize that it's another person, I just go, what's cooking? Good looking. <laughs> Their mouth moves at the same time as yours, and seemingly the same words as yours, but you can't hear anything but your own voice. I mean, you can hear plenty of what's going on around you, but it's not like you hear their voice as well. The person in the reflection, however, uh, is uh, a uh, seemingly much smaller woman than you. Uh, you know, almost uh, pale to the point of seeming frail. Uh, with a, a long, thick braid, who is leaning out further over the canal to match your movement and position in it. Uh, but her eyes are wide and seem surprised, if not necessarily um, afraid. Uh, even if you do say so yourself, maybe a little curious. Can I hold a hand out to her? <laughs> <laughs> you reach out a hand, and where it breaks the surface of uh, the canal, it gets wet. She also seems to hold out her hand, although the reflection gets muddied by the ripples from your hand touching the canal. It's extraordinarily cold, uh, I should point out. Mm. But it just seems to be water. Yeah. Uh, don't fall in. <laughs> I lean back so she's not having to <laughs> lean far as much over <laughs> She matches the motion and uh, is gone from your sight once you're straight up. I point at what remains of the reflection and say, quiet. Then I point at Lissa and say, riotous. Then I point back, quiet, riotous. <laughs> I think oh, I good. You've this is addressed. <laughs> <laughs> this is addressed both to Lissa and to Romnet. Yes, and uh, I am sure that she may try to find you once we are on the other side of the canal. A careful observer while Ramana is speaking will actually note that there are staircases leading down into the canal from which people are both walking into and in some cases walking out of. Uh, transit between the two sides of the reflection seems to be 
pretty simple and free. Uh, are they but... wet? <laughs> no, huh. they are not. Those emerging are not wet, huh? They do shiver a little. <sighs> so about that drink. <laughs> <laughs> yes, first things first. Presuming you have been following Ramnet this whole time, uh, you are led in short order to a uh, squat but very broad building with, well, you can perceive that light is blazing out through the windows, but it doesn't cast any light into the street or the sidewalk. Uh, but when you walk in, it has actually a pretty homey atmosphere. Uh, you know, many tables made of honest-to-God wood, uh, you know, chairs similarly, a uh, polished bar, a uh, staircase in the back presumably leading up to rooms to let. Uh, there is uh, a small crowd uh, inside, a couple dozen people spread out uh, throughout the relatively large interior space. It's comfortably warm, and the light here actually does come from candles and lamps, uh, and uh, is in you know yellow orange welcoming hue. Uh, as you walk in, you see that there are a cluster of people around the bar uh, that are uh, seemingly very uh focused on uh a particular woman uh she is uh, perhaps tall although not by Lissa's standards uh six foot uh more or less with platinum blonde hair and a solid build uh her hair is uh kept in these elaborate braids that stay kind of uh close to her head uh her eyes are uh, a playful glowing uh icy blue and uh she has very clear very smooth kind of medium dark skin all of this is easy to take in because almost the attention of the entire bar is on her as she sings what appears to be an extremely body song although the references and terms are so elliptical and euphemistic that they are pretty hard to follow from the midpoint uh, but judging by the reactions of her audience of about 10 or so other people, uh, you know, uh, they are they are reacting to every other line with, uh, you know, Whoa! and, ah! <laughs> and uh, you know, elbowing each other and winking at each other. Uh, and so you gather from context that this is uh, ribald in the extreme. Uh, she has a stone mug of prodigious size in one hand from which occasionally slosh suds as though of ale or beer. Uh, most of the rest of the people in the bar are seated around tables trying to ignore the commotion going on near the bar. When I hear the crowd reacting, I pretend to get the jokes. <laughs> uh, I don't pretend to get the jokes, but I wander over and have a good time and cheer and clap when appropriate. I do get the jokes, and I nod at the singer. <laughs> <laughs> uh actually uh when the singer uh does make eye contact with you ramnet uh uh she finishes the song uh pretty quickly and then uh you know sort of uh makes a flourish and a bit of a bow drains off the rest of uh her stone mug and kind of puts it down to one side and then uh you know kind of turns to face you and says well the prophet graces us how do you do? Good evening. It is evening, yes. Well, day or night. It's always a good time. I don't recognize your friends. That's unusual. Few enough in Fermata I haven't seen at least once or twice. Um, she puts on a big old smile uh, that gets wider uh, when she uh, turns her attention to Lissa. Name's Lissa. What's yours? I am Avin. Certainly nice to make your acquaintance. Oh, it's nice to meet yours. Oh, well, you flatter me, I'm sure. And you are? She turns to Dask. Uh, D Dask Tear, I say, attempting to look as though I'm very at home. <laughs> <laughs> she she nods. She says, uh, very, very pleased. We have newcomers in Fermata so infrequently. How did you come by this place? Strangely and suddenly? <laughs> That's usually the way of it. Uh, the will, she turns the while she says that to... God. She's in the middle of pouring some more brew into her uh, mug, and it sloshes when you say that. She puts the bottle back down and turns and says, Oh, is that so? 
Well, what's special about you then? I mean, not to be rude, I'm sure there's plenty, but as far as the big guy is concerned, what's special about you? Still trying to figure that out, if I can be completely honest. Uh, I think a good <laughs> drink and a warm meal will help a lot with that process. Oh, of course, where are my manners? That's usually the way of it with the big guy. She waves over the barmaid uh, and says, Two bowls of stew and two big mugs of ale for our new guests, please. On me. And uh, the uh, barmaid, you know, sort of smiles and blushes and curtsies at her and then scurries I, I, off. I will, to, before to she scurries order. off, uh, order, you know, a sandwich and a glass of wine. Not, naturally, on Veen. Yeah, uh, the the barmaid nods uh, perfunctorily and then scurries off uh, for good this time. Uh, Evine turning back to the newcomer says, Well, anything in particular bring a, bring you to our fine town? I just felt like I was being summoned here. Um, it's been a little bit of a rough day, so you'll apologize if I'm not at my finest. But at the very least, for your kindness, I would like to tip you generously. <laughs> She chuckles. She says, oh, I don't really take tips. It's, you know, tip the barmaid if you must. Uh, I appreciate your generosity, but, well, she looks around. To be honest, I'm kind of slumming it here. Technically, I've been nominated mayor by the big guy. It's not a position I don't think I'm well suited to, but I try my best. Uh, at this point, the barmaid returns with the food, handing uh, Lissa and Dask a bowl and a mug each, uh, and then uh, handing... Uh, Ramnet, a uh, sandwich, and a goblet. I, uh, with I hold wine. the mug, and even so, I try to steeple my fingers. The, the The effect is quite awkward, and I say, "The big guy." Uh, that's usually how I refer to the Obsidian God head honcho around here. Really, it's his, uh, his town, uh, as you can probably tell by looking around. Everything all dreary and underlit. Uh, and obsidian wasn't the gig I asked for, but I try to do my. My level best. The city is in capable hands. I like the cheery atmosphere in here. Feel right at home. And I toss back my ale. Uh, All of it. She reaches up to clap you on the shoulder right as you toss back your ale, uh, causing you to splutter a little bit, but not to lose any ale. Uh, and uh, very important. That's an attitude that I like. Well, one one of the notable things about the Obsidian God is that explanations are often short and insufficient and one does not always feel that one is doing what one is suited toward so here we all are the lower half of my face is uh, sipping my stew the upper half looks as though i've received the worst possible news <laughs> uh evine does not notice this at all and goes hey, ain't that the truth then ain't that the truth well i, I will raise you know. my goblet at her she raises her, uh, you know, Stein tankard mug. I've been using a lot of different words for it. And uh, says, to the big guy, I suppose, and drains it off, looking very, you know, sort of uh, carefree and ruddy in the cheeks. Um, I like her. <laughs> <laughs> I will actually offer to uh, prophecy for Avine if she does have any questions. Uh, so, after a little bit of thought, she'll say, well, I do kind of wonder why these newcomers are brought here. Any information, any insight on that? No offense, you two, by the way. I'm glad you're here. It's just, anytime the Obsidian God wants something in particular, I tend to think of it as making my job a little harder. No offense taken, I say, slipping and pretending not to have slipped uh, on the arm that I'm <laughs> leaning on on the bar. Uh, I I also say uh, no offense taken whatsoever and kind of uh, lift my cup to her and nod with a wink. So I think that for that, uh, how to spell it actually? Ooh shit! Is this the first time? Ooh. Esoteric skills, <laughs> esoteric paths are coming up in this uh, this campaign. In this case. I think it would actually be mortal sorcery. Oh shit! You're right. Pardon, pardon my Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> <laughs> the first real role that does not involve head bonking, head bonking, and or stair counting. 
No, I only because I don't actually have, you know, I, I had to tailor my, my uh, spell selection. So I don't, I, I, I mm. suspect I have more narrative related prophesying if you want to just give me, like, a sense plus sorcery for general magic. Oh, um, I think that's actually going to be sense plus eerie uh for this one I, I like using the eerie skill which for our listeners is in rain the skill that lets you detect the otherworldly or the supernatural okay then that is seven dice for me rather than six plus a master die so boo uh, <laughs> yes tell us her fortunes beautiful prophet yeah man however that is three eights very good um so you sort of focus inward in the way that you have learned to do since becoming the prophet of the obsidian god and you don't exactly hear mott's voice but you do sort of sense mott's will and what's more you sense it coming from the two newcomers near you uh and realize with a start that they have been gifted some of mott's being Uh, Though the precise nature of this arrangement eludes you temporarily, or for the moment, I guess I should say, it is very clear that pieces of Mott are close to you right now. They are themselves, but also extensions of Mott. Sorry, I do not say Mott. I very explicitly do not say Mott. They are extensions of the Obsidian God. Big guy's got his fingers in all sorts of pies. Naveen looks uh, at Dusk and at Lissa and says, My condolence is not likely to be an easy job, but uh, looks like you're deputies of a sort. I'm tipsy and I I think I look cool, but I'm probably just beaming. Fair enough. Uh, Naveen sort of uh, gives you considering looks and says, Well... Looks like we'll be working together. I'm not sure precisely what the big guy has in mind for you, but if it's a bed you're looking for, there are some here. I'll comp them for you uh, until we can get you proper quarters. Presumably, uh, it'll be in or near the manifestation if you're going to be working that closely with the big guy. Uh, Any clue what pieces you got? Big guy has a lot of responsibilities or so, I gather. This is possibly a GM question. Do we know that? I think that that is actually going to be a role okay. if you would like to look inward and find out. Um, I'm going to make it because I am a little bit uh, capricious. Uh, I'm going to make that a, a sense plus empathy. Role. Okay. Jeez, rude. I feel like... If I'm trying to figure out what, what manner of pieces they have, what would it be for me? He said it. Also, when we a were sense in plus empathy area, role. Though. So let the record show: sense plus empathy for me is two. Same. That's all. That's mm-hmm. why. That's why Adam laughed the way he did. He knew that both of us would just you be rolling two. And for me, it's a six. I got this a is, zero and, I, and, I, and, I say, a, a, ten and I say an this with love. You dirty motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Tips subtext hat. to what I was just yeah. ranting about. But I got a and ten and an eight. Hmm. Oh shit! Mott did I mean, say I, it. I, I, I swear to you, I'm not fucking with you. This is two sevens. Three fives. Nice. Um, so probably because of the remarks that uh, the Obsidian God made from the well uh, back in the hearth there, you can figure it out with uh, Dusk's uh, sudden flash of insight that you currently are the steward, the almost the embodiment. No the duke of nothing not that you don't have anything but that the very idea concept and essence of nothing is both yours to command and is yours to steward protect and promote uh remembering the obsidian god's words in the heart that leaves fury as uh lissa's estate uh and uh sure enough perhaps to lissa's surprise that does seem to check out when you look inward 
I mean, I guess you could be furiously happy. It doesn't have to uh, deal with anger. <laughs> Evine kind of uh, chuckles and says, you could just be a fury, frankly, and looks up at you. <laughs> oh, no, I'm definitely a handful. <laughs> More than one, if I had to guess. She smiles lasciviously with absolutely no hint of subtlety and only a little hint of drunkenness. <laughs> I, I will, return the I will smile look at her. and said that you're... <laughs> I will look at her. I am beat. I am beat red, as I say. Smart. I don't mean to interrupt, but but nothing. Nothing is nothing is the thing I'm not. I'm not nothing. Nothing is not the thing that I am. I'm everything, but the only thing that I'm not is nothing. Nothing is not the thing that I could possibly be. I'm not. You're the that. Duke of everything. Look at you. <laughs> Clearly, there's been some mistake. Exactly what she said. I'm not. It's not that. I'm not. It isn't. <laughs> Evine goes oh don't take it too hard I feel like being the duke of nothing doesn't mean you are well you are nothing but it's not like you're not anything you're just you are the stuff of nothing the duke of nothing whatever's left of my drink I'd down it <laughs> like it's nothing <laughs> <laughs> like it's very particularly not nothing mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I will pat boy. him on the shoulder um I pretend not to notice. <laughs> Evine finally sort of like stretches a little bit and goes, well, I've probably spent too much time here, but lovely as it's, as it's been. Welcome, though, to Fermata. Um, my lord, my lady, I suppose. Uh, she says it with a minimum of cheekiness. Uh, just uh, Lisa, where can I find you later? Oh, well, I'm usually down here in the Rita city when I'm not working, but when I'm working... Uh, I'm up in the quiet city at City Hall. Uh, can't miss it, really, if you go up there. Down there? Well, it's down from here. But I think of it as up there for some reason. Confusing place, but you get used to it. In any case, feel free to come find me. And she gives you kind of like elevator eyes. <laughs> anytime. Uh, and then she pauses for a significant like one and a half count. And then goes, both of you, really. Uh, and then glances at Ramnet and goes... And you know where to find me when you need me. As uh, ever. I attempt a courtly bow. I'll probably come within an inch of hitting my head on the bar and then go back to feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> uh, Evine pats you uh, companionably on the shoulder and says, <laughs> uh, do enjoy your first day, night, afternoon. Hard to tell. Uh, especially in the riotous city. doesn't ever seem to really shut down. But uh, enjoy it and uh, seek me out if you need me. Uh, in the meantime, I would not expect too much of a respite from the big guy. I'm sure he'll have something for you to do pretty shortly. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for making him comfortable, O oh Prophet. Of and, course. Uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of each other. And she gives you kind of like a imaginary hat tip that splits the difference between being kind of sardonic and sincere. Uh, I, I will. I will do a very formal like one hand over the other, and if you look closely, it's an eye that my hands mm. make a shape out of. And sort of quarter bow forward over it. I, I skip uh, any formalities and just say, oh yes, much more. <laughs> <laughs> she gives, flashes you a smile and heads out uh, at a brisk walk. Um, she, uh, you know, sort of the flourish of the half cape on the back of her uh, relatively everyday clothes. Uh, it's uh, a black silk with a silver inner lining. Uh, the most dramatic piece of clothing that she wears by far. Uh, she's gone out the door and you are left in this uh, relatively almost strangely normal pub uh, you know in the middle of this very abnormal city can I call the barmaid over you certainly can okay I do that uh, she's <laughs> she scurries over uh, seemingly in awe of your stature uh, <laughs> she uh, you know, uh, Bob's a very quick curtsy, but uh, starts by craning her neck up and then just contents herself with looking ahead for a moment until she realizes where that puts her gaze and then looks down <laughs> at your feet and asks, what can I get you? Oh, Shaku, do you have any white lightning? Oh, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, we've got ale and beer and wine and some spirits, I think. I mean, what's the strongest drink on your shelf, darling? 
oh, she blushes when you call her darling. Uh, and she says, probably the local whiskey. I honestly don't know where they make it from, but it just tastes like fire to me. Mm, that sounds perfect. Milady. I'll get around to that for uh, everyone here, actually. <laughs> And I put, slide a bunch of coins across the counter to her. <laughs> uh, she, uh, you know, sort of looks at them and counts the first three and goes, this is far too much, milady. Uh, tip included. She goes. And it's Lissa. Um, of course, milady Lissa. And she scoops all of the coins into, uh, you know, purse, uh, slides it under the, the bar, and then scurries off to pour. Now, when you said everybody here, did you gesture at the whole establishment? Oh, the whole or bar. Just I'm buying drinks for <laughs> everyone. Cool. Uh, <laughs> it's been to, a day. <laughs> yeah. She goes to a clay jug and pours uh, a tray full of what are basically small stone vessels. Uh, they're uh, a little larger than modern shot glasses, but smaller than, you know, uh, a, you know, full low ball and uh, starts carrying the tray around, starting with you, Lissa, and then uh, Dusk and Ramnet, if you uh, want yours, you can take them off the tray I, I, and then I she circulates. I will take it, and in, in sort of the same way that, that Lissa has been flirting with most everyone else i i will very specifically <laughs> make eyes at dusk and, and... <laughs> dusk's eyes are as wide as saucers uh but his mouth is quirked as though he's the picture of composure and uh he returns the toast and takes a takes a drink um how often dusk does dusk wow tongue twister how often does dusk drink spirits that was a that was a good tongue twister um dusk drinks spirits regularly but he probably is in the habit of making people think he's drunker than he is <laughs> fair enough uh so you probably don't have to make a roll to get this just kind of down uh but boy it burns it burns <laughs> like fire uh on the way and uh you manage to just kind of wheeze instead of cough uh you know saving a little bit of face i'm completely um, convinced Lisa, i look extremely suave as i do so i mean I, I while we're at it i'm while we're at it just for the full force of the thing i'm going to roll fascinate at him <laughs> <laughs> by all means which for me do. is three plus a master we got mechanics with a, man. Let's with, use a minim- <laughs> with a minimum height of seven <laughs> yeah that's right because you're beautiful oh uh, i'm a little bit beautiful too are you beautiful eat- at three points or five He's uh, beautiful at three. Okay. Yeah. We're equally beautiful then, statistically speaking. <laughs> so that that pair of fives becomes three fives becomes three sevens. <laughs> Lucky sevens. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Dusk, uh, this prophet of the Obsidian God is really turning on the dazzle. Uh, you know, you are uh, rather impressed uh, by his charisma and presence as he, as suavely as you probably, although you don't have a mirror, but, you know, giving him credit where it's due, it's pretty suave. Uh, You know, he uh, takes his drink and gives you a very charming smile. I'm seeing, like, the prototypical handsome anime face. Eyes a little squinted. (laughs) Yeah. Features chiseled. Yeah, sure. (laughs) <laughs> i was gonna say if you're imagining or high school host club but then again i think probably that's not precisely romnet's version of handsome no <laughs> uh so uh yeah you probably are pretty close there uh but yeah uh you know uh full effect of charm waves radiating off of this uh prophet with his obsidian jewelry is it hot in um, here <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone else in the warm? meantime every single person in the in the bar room is uh toasting lissa as they uh receive and throw back their drinks i am doing the same uh, but my while my arms gesture toward lissa my eyes are completely fixed on robnet <laughs> <laughs> uh the um uh barmaid uh comes back over uh and uh says Lady Lissa, the other patrons wanted me uh, to tell you that your uh, meal or room or next drink, whatever you wanted this evening, they're going to take care of it uh, in recompense. Uh, they were 
very appreciative of the gesture and she bobs a curtsy while looking at your feet uh and then starts to scurry off Uh, does she get away before i can stop her no no you can stop her first Uh, it's again it's just lessa you don't have to say my lady and i'll have another one of these that was good (laughs) of course my lady lissa i'm afraid you you know the title is i mean well she shrugs and says I'll be right back with your drink, milady, milady, Lissa, Lissa, milady, uh, just... and then she <laughs> comes back with another. It's I think I've to be okay. <laughs> I think I've waited for a reasonable opening, although I almost certainly haven't. I say, so you're a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the sense that I am occasionally given answers to other people's questions. I look at you with hunger. <laughs> <laughs> that honestly probably is unintentionally one of the best lines I could have used on Dusk. <laughs> yeah, no, you didn't know, but it was that was that was the shit right there. Yeah. Mm. So, can you tell our fortunes? Instinctively, I remove a glove and show my palm. <laughs> I will take out the the bottle of liquid that I carry with me, and presumably a bowl and a pitcher of water materialize in the way that they pretty well always do. And The barmaid sees you bringing out your supplies and immediately bustles over uh, with the necessary, the requisite uh, bowl and pitcher. What's bigger than a saucer? A uh, dusk size or satellite dishes? <laughs> full dinner plates that's upsetting (laughs) (laughs) just twin moons (laughs) yeah exactly exactly uh knowledge generally has prices but i think that you both have paid some today so let's go with one question each and i will offer what answers come does that sound fair Yes. I nod 50 times very quickly. (laughs) You first, (laughs) Doc. I I will shuffle the cards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's very like, hey, I've got a deck of Night Vale tarot cards. Oh, nice. Marvelous. (laughs) This is not this is not sponsorship. This is just no, it's just it's a fidgeting device. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we all uh, do love Night Vale. Just throwing what's not that to out love, there. yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, and so I will nod at you to ask your question as I am just shuffling the uh, cards. Uh, I, I, I think for what I think is just a moment, what may be up to 30 seconds in reality, <laughs> um, staring at you intensely, and I say. Uh, the big guy. What does the big guy want of me? And how does being nothing fit into that? (laughs) So, not mentioning that that is two questions. (laughs) 1.5. Setting aside questions of math further. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I will pour two drops from the bottle into the pitcher and from the pitcher then into the bowl and uh, have a sip, gesturing at the bowl. (laughs) I take a sip. All right. I I absolutely, I I sip it. There's a beat in which I do not sip it. I look at the bowl. I look at Romnet. I look at the bowl. I look at Romnet. Then and... I sip it greedily, as though, <laughs> as though to convince everyone looking, which may be no one, but everyone looking that I knew what to do from the beginning. And so, it's water, but at the same time, like, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that cold. It shouldn't feel like ice that has flipped the bit and is somehow hot again. <laughs> uh, 
It's like when you get up in the middle of the night and you take a sip of water and it fe- you feel the temperature too much and you think, shit, I haven't had enough water. <laughs> you feel the temperature every inch down you. Yeah. Is that the situation? And, yeah. and there's also sort of a sharpness to it. Yeah, like, yeah. Not not mint sharpness, but like somewhere between celery and horseradish. But it's just water. Uh, you saw me, you know, you saw the water appear, you saw two drops of black liquid turn the entire thing black in in a modified version of, like, how holy water is produced. Uh, and I take a, I, I dip my index finger into just past the surface and, and put a drop of that on my tongue and use the same finger to parcel out three cards, which I will then flip over, they appear, you know, they, they, they are tarot cards in some sense, but they are not, you know, tarot cards of Earth, obviously. Mm-hmm. There are no labels. There are suits, perhaps, but it would take a good deal more looking at the cards to understand what they do. Uh and then I will roll, presumably, again, Sense plus Eerie, Adam. Correct. Uh, so, that is three sixes. Three s- seem to be the order of the day for me. How very appropriate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you flip over the cards. The illustrations are esoteric to any outside observer but they resolve instantly into meaning for you however before you can explain anything you feel your mouth move and hear your voice speak without you uh and speaking in your own voice and yet somehow clearly not you even to your listeners uh you say child nothingness you are welcome here in Fermata, but soon you shall have to depart. Your task, darkness, the fear, the reverence must grow, must start here and spread. You will know what to do. And then you feel the control of your vocal cords and the mouth return to you. Uh, well, not perhaps the first time this has happened to you, but certainly never particularly pleasant. Yeah, I will sort of, like, move my <laughs> mouth around and, like, take a drink of the whiskey to get the taste out. Yeah. Das Dies are no... No, good word, sorry. You go. I was going to say <laughs> Das Dies are no longer twin moons. They're, twi- they're binary suns. Uh, enormous <laughs> and yet his, his mouth quirks in sympathetic uh, uh, disgust when he sees that uh, that Romnet is not especially enjoying the experience I mean it's one of those comes with the job that was handed to me that's out of character I suppose since you didn't actually but yes and your question also I uh, can, can I ask that too because he, he got to <laughs> <laughs> Only one was one point five. <laughs> one one point five. Okay. Um. Let me think about this. I suspect. This then. I suspect further that I may not be the one answering. So ask what you will. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll just go for the both of the big questions that are currently on my mind and hope for the best. Um. The first is. Why Fury? Because I'm a nice person. Like, you've hung out with me. <laughs> I might be a bit big, but I'm not an angry person. And also, is there a way to, like, um, make things go back to normal? Okay, so same deal with, you know, the, the bowl is already full of the relevant liquid, mm-hmm. whatever it is. I'm and nodding furiously. Cards. I like this question. <laughs> I will also enjoy that you're nodding furiously. And so I will indicate the bowl. Take a sip. I take a sip like it's a shot. 
and I will. I like that. Lick the salt off you... the rim and like. In- index finger of the wow. other hand to the surface of, of the liquid to my tongue and make another roll. Do. Sense plus eerie. Okay. Five eights. Damn, son. Boy, oh boy. Uh, that's a lot. Um, this time your voice does not sound like yours. Uh, it sounds like the one that came out of the well. Uh, Probably everybody speak. in the establishment is turning to listen. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that voice, uh, you know, carries and they know what it is. Um, and uh, speaking to Lissa, uh, you say, or you hear yourself say, sort of you hear your mouth be used to say child fury you are what you could only be there is more to you than will help to spread reverence even fear of darkness darkness itself it must grow it must increase you will increase it your fury knows no and this time once the final word trails off Remnant you end up just like in a coughing fit and uh, uh. the uh, uh, the the uh, serving girl uh, rushes over with just like a, a stone vessel full of water for you I, I thank her and slide her a coin sort of sleight of handly yeah. She uh, bobs a curtsy with murmured thanks and then puts the bar and a few feet between you and her. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, that was something that happened. <laughs> Been a while. Uh, Been the a... bar room is still pretty quiet at this point, so everything you say is very <laughs> like, carrying. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> I am not an angry person, just so you know. <laughs> She's not an angry person, I say twice as loud as I mean to. (laughs) Everybody kind of looks at you for a minute, a couple nod slowly, and most of them then just kind of like turn back slowly to their drinks and and their conversations, which start quiet and then get louder. Another drink uh, for everyone on on me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The serving girl, uh, Bob's a cursing, says, Yes, Milady Lissa, your previous payment covers it quite handily, Milady Lissa. Uh, Don't think twice about it. And, uh, you know, starts putting together a tray. You're the best. Uh, why, thank you, Milady Lissa. Uh, and, uh, Are you going to ask her name? Make eye contact. <laughs> oh, yeah, what is your name? <laughs> Kea. Well, my lady, lady Kea, Lissa. thank you for your assistance. Oh, why? You're welcome, Milady Lissa. And then she doesn't quite sprint with the tray but looks as though she wants to uh around the bar room to uh you know uh serve everyone uh their drinks i'm getting serious deuce vibes and i'm here for it <laughs> <laughs> unintentional but you know now that you've mentioned it i'm gonna lean into it because deuce is absolutely the best um <laughs> i can't do the voice though uh in any case uh Another round comes around. I'm assuming you included yourself in that. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, drink. and you my also, friends. You also notice Kea uh, take a drink this time, too. <laughs> um, uh, although she tries to be surreptitious about it. I, I grin um, teethily at her. <laughs> uh, she, uh, you know, again, looks very flustered, uh, if adorably so. Uh, and tries to, to discharge her responsibilities uh, in the bar room of the pub uh, without getting too distracted. Um, if there are any other specific questions or, or points of order you would like to address with Romnet, uh, you certainly have time. Otherwise, I should perhaps assume that, you know, you while away a little decompression period with your dinner and your drinks uh, in the bar room. Uh, and you do have, you know, free rooms waiting for you upstairs. I mean, when the time comes. I would ask of them, you know, what and where they were before. Good point. I'll add first and foremost that I'm looking at Romnet whenever I'm pretty sure he's not looking at me. 
Um, I'm probably wrong at least half the time. I say that I'm uh, I'm from a merchant family. I don't like to talk about it, but I just want to know everything. I uh, I, I try to learn as much as I can, meet as many people as I can. I've been to. I've been to the four corners of Taraxis. Uh, I, 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 I don't know why I would be called to the, the estate of, of nothing, of all things. It seems an insult. If anything, I take a drink. I fall silent for a while. I reiterate that he's actually the Duke of everything. I nod vigorously, and I, uh, I feel very, very close to Lissa. <laughs> I wish I could be a better wingman in that moment. The, the thing about nothing is that voids are a bit like vacuums and they seek to be filled. Nature abhors me, though. That's the thing. I don't like to be abhorred. Nature is not all there is, and I will offer him a half smile. Each eye is a binary sun. <laughs> <laughs> What is larger than a binary sun? <laughs> a galaxy each yes. are are the eyes. <laughs> Two binary suns. <laughs> these these descriptions are drifting from the figurative to the terrifying. I just want to let you know. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Are we not, are we not, are we not doing game. cosmic horror? I'm sorry. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not not doing cosmic horror. I guess <laughs> sure. on slide. Sure. <laughs> Forge mistress of Pilton. I did a little bit of labor here and there, mostly farm work. Tough, but honest work. I wouldn't know about that. Hmm. I will offer a self-deprecating smile. (laughs) I I, I mimic the self-deprecating smile. (laughs) Um, at around that time, uh, the uh, Lissa, you feel uh, just kind of like a tug. Um, I would say on your sleeve, but I don't know if you're wearing any. Uh, maybe just on sort of like you know the shirt, your shirt above your belt, uh, and uh, turn to see that the uh, serving girl, um, Kea, uh, is uh, standing there. Uh, you know, kind of looking up over your shoulder. <laughs> uh and and looking a little self-conscious but also a little rosy-cheeked and you remember that she had 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 a drink a little earlier and she said milady miss lissa lissa milady i hope it's not too forward of me but i wanted to ask that's i've never seen a tattoo so big did it hurt not at all oh i've heard they're very painful and they take a long time so it just seemed strange but it's very i like to look at it though i sorry you can't sorry Malini. oh no no it's not for it at all i mean I, you can't see most of it when all my clothes are on she goes scarlet from her hairline to her neckline and bobs a curtsy and says I'm sure it's lovely, Miss Lissa. I should really get back to what I need to be doing and <laughs> leaves like a smoke trail behind her as she tries to find somewhere else. There's a, there's a her shaped cloud left where she was. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I lean in over to Dosk and go, do you think I scared her off? In a good way. Uh, good. <laughs> I, I have a feeling, I suppose, is what I'm saying that uh, that she'll she'll be back. <laughs> Moths and flames. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what was that, Romnut? <laughs> Moths and flames. Which is which? I think that's apparent. Hmm. 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 I pretend to know what he means. I mean, uh, I do have a bright personality. <laughs> awkward silence um, I mean I'm just smirking Michael, awkward yeah. silence <laughs> as the evening wears on a bit you actually get a few of the other patrons kind of approaching to introduce themselves and shake hands um, and uh, you know the 
sort of more outgoing, you know, personable and ruddy cheeked ones uh, invariably gravitate toward Lissa, uh, usually with a pretty appreciative eye and uh, an appreciation for her demeanor, while the sort of more reserved types seem to gravitate a little bit more toward Dusk uh, and, um, you know, uh, come away seeming to feel as though they've had a great conversation, even if maybe later they would be hard pressed to recount any of its content. Uh, and in this way, the evening wears on, uh, until, well, it's not like the sun goes down and the stars come out or anything, but the bar room does eventually mostly empty out. Um, and it seems probably as though it is getting to be time, uh, for everyone to retire. Certainly our travelers of late, Dosk and Lissa, you are feeling pretty beat by this point, partially because of the drinking, um, but also because of all of the, you know, activity and traveling and how full your day has been uh, and how full your soul is of a shard of a obsidian god. Uh, you know, that too. Um, Small things. <laughs> we've all been there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how relatable this content <laughs> is. <laughs> if we do our job, hopefully it will become so uh but the um you know the the rooms upstairs are beckoning uh and kea uh you know offers to show show you to them uh presumably at this point uh, is about when uh ramnet uh sort of makes his goodbye so perhaps we should uh you know cover that first if there's anything in particular you want to leave your new associates with uh, i will i will let them know where my house is and let them know that it is in the same location in the riotous and the quiet city. And that does seem significant uh, <laughs> that it is, is is in both in the same spot. But are you uh, always in both? It's the same house. It, you go out one door, it's the quiet city. You go out the other door, it's the riotous city. Mm. Eyes like black holes that have eaten galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is, is that next session, you will be hard-pressed to begin topping that. <laughs> Presumably, once he sleeps, his eyes will go back to normal. I Well, it remains to be seen. <laughs> Cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, Perhaps you'll flip the bit and start with a white hole. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so... Uh, you know, uh, bidding you goodbye, letting you know where his, uh, you know, where he's to be found. Uh, Ramnet heads out uh, into the only somewhat quieter late evening of the riotous city, uh, and Kea comes to offer to show you to your rooms. Uh, she leads you up the stairs uh, and shows Dosk to the first room on the left. Uh, it's You've seen worse, you've stayed in worse, but it's nothing particularly special, other than, of course, the fact that the walls are made of obsidian, only the furniture and the floor is made of wood. Uh, you even have a window, uh, though it is difficult to... You have to be standing all the way in it with your uh, face very close to the casement uh, before you can resolve anything outside of it into a sensible vista of, of the, the riotous city. Um Kea leads uh, Lissa to the next door uh, and opens it for you and he says, I do hope you'll have a lovely stay, Milady Lissa, and come back sometime. I know we're not the, well, fanciest place around and I'm sure you'll be surrounded by, you know, the, the fanciness of uh, that Fermata can offer, but, well... She shrugs a shoulder and looks down, uh, plucking at the hem of her apron, uh, and says, It has been a pleasure serving you, my lady Lissa, has it? And then gestures you in the door. Um, I kind of step back um, and open the door for her and say, and It seems a little bit cold in here. I wonder what we could do to warm this place up a little bit. Oh, we certainly have some firewood. I don't notice the temperature very much of late i don't guess but let me go grab some for you and she starts to scurry down the hallway toward the stairs uh, uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> she seems very happy to be helpful for whatever that's worth um and uh as you are 
uh, you know, unlacing your boots, she comes back with a small armful of firewood uh, to, to put in the fireplace uh, and says, I'll just get this going for you then, my lady Lissa, mm-hmm. uh, as she starts to, uh, you know, uh, stack the wood and uh, much appreciated pile tender. Lady Kea. Oh, you, you really shouldn't, my lady, but, but thank you all the same. In very short order, there is a cheery fire uh, burning in the fireplace, and she stands up and curtsies to you uh, where you are sitting on the bed, bootless, um, and says, Is there anything else you require, Milady Lessa? Mm, maybe a bath? She goes, Oh, uh, well, we'll heat some water in the morning, uh, but if you don't mind a cold one, I can show you where they are. I can, I've had enough of cold water today. I think I can wait for the morning. Very well. I hope you sleep marvelously, Milady Lissa, and let me know if there's anything you require. Uh, she gives you a, a curtsy uh, and heads for the door. Uh, and with that, uh, you're both abed for the evening. And, Some people just uh, can't take a hint. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it fun. Anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, in which you Adam both, uh, gets to be coy all the time. Yeah. yeah. In Even which I cannot press any further. Game. GM slash coquette. <laughs> yeah, our listeners won't be able to see me batting my eyelashes, <laughs> but I'm doing it. Um, in due time, uh, probably... Uh, fairly soon given the the traveling and the drinking uh, both of you fall asleep and you won't know it unless you discuss it in the morning but the dream that you have is the same you have a view from a high vantage point over what you recognize as the whole of Taraxis though there's no way you could really see all of it from one spot Uh, and there are precious few landmarks that you recognize specifically but in that way that dreams have you know that's what you're seeing. You're seeing it lit by the noonday sun, uh, cheery and beautiful. You open your mouth to say something. You're not sure what, but instead of words, out of your mouth, and then after a moment, out of your eyes, nose, ears, pours darkness. It must be pouring out of you at a prodigious rate because it covers the landscape in moments and you can see nothing, but you feel a profound sense of peace, which sticks with you until you awaken the next morning. And I think that's where we'll leave it for this time. We will uh, begin next time with your first day and your first tasks uh, in Fermata. Uh, but having gotten you settled, uh, I think that is uh, a good stopping point. Uh, our play should gain momentum as we go forward, but hopefully uh, you guys had as much fun as I did there. Um, any last uh, you know, thoughts or, or intentions uh, that we wish to get on the docket for next time? I assume that I am not a party to that dream. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> this would be a nobles only i was gonna say my dude ended up way more flustered than i expected but it was actually perfect uh i I hope uh, i hope folks found it relatable uh when surrounded by strange things uh don't expect yourself to uh to to not be caught flat-footed uh by the (laughs) by the utter enormity of uh of uh, your situation i love dosk dosk is great (laughs) dosk is lovely Oh, uh, I, I enjoyed all of you guys' character work today uh, quite a bit, and I look forward to seeing more of it. Well, I think that concludes our first session of our Nightfall campaign. Thanks for joining us. I hope our players and listeners enjoyed it as much as I did, and that you'll all join us again next time. If you're hearing us now, then you probably know where to listen to this, but we can be found almost any place one can listen to podcasts, as well as on the wider web at DicePunks.com and on Twitter as at DicePunks. With that, I think we're ready to say farewell. Say goodbye to the kind player, kind folks at home, players. I mean, if you've got 30 or so questions, as I know I do, I mean, those are good places to send them. Come come at us, fellow punks. 
<laughs> and will try to answer them as enigmatically as the obsidian god would. <laughs> Good night, sleep tight, don't let the moonshine bite. <laughs> Very appropriate. And as the poet once said, exit light, enter night. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, dear listeners, for listening to the first episode of our first campaign. And stick around through the admin stuff. Bromnet has a prophecy for you. We can't wait for you to hear the next episode of Nightfall, due out on May 15th, so if you enjoyed this at all, definitely don't miss that. We're really excited for all that Nightfall has in store for our players and for our listeners. The songs in this episode, Theme of the Dice Punks, were written and recorded by the Duke of Nothing himself, Drew. Cover art is by Joanne, who will be behind the scenes for the time being, but played Rue, the Gremlin, in our Psionics one-shot. Site design and graphics for DicePunks.com are by Robin, the player behind the irrepressible Lissa, the Duchess of Fury. Uh, Rain and the one roll engine it runs on were created by Greg Stoltze, whose work can be found in, well, a frankly astonishing number of cool places, but I'll point you toward GregStoltze.com. Nobilis was created by Jenna Catherine Moran, and can be found alongside much of her other really intriguing work, both in and outside of tabletop roleplaying, at afarandsunlessland.wordpress.com. Links to both systems and authors can be found on the punk grimoire section of our website, dicebox.com. Thanks so much for listening. If you liked what you heard, well, that's reward enough on its own, really, but if you're so inclined, you can help us out by rating and reviewing us wherever you listen to us, telling your friends who you think would like us to give us a listen, and even by heading over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash dicepunks. We have fun rewards available to backers, including a patron-only Discord and access to the Dice Peaks After Show for episodes one and following. Regardless, we hope you'll tune in again, and until then, remember, subtlety is for cowards. Remember that For every smile in the darkness, there are at least two rows of teeth.